Hello and welcome to the Omnex webinar, ISO 27001, Information Security Management Systems. Today's presenters are Chad Keimel, Omnex CTO, and Tom Welsh. Chad Keimel is the CTO and founder of Omnex, an international consulting and training organization headquartered in Ann Arbor, Michigan, in the United States. Over the course of Chad's successful career, he has served on the Malcolm Baldrige Board of Examiners and has received numerous quality achievement awards, including the Quality Professional of the Year Award awarded by the American Society for Quality. Chad is also the president of Omnex Systems, a software provider for ISO 9001, 14001, and 27001, as well as others. Chad has developed and teaches management system courses for ISO 9001, 14001, 27001, 45001, and, and integrated management systems, which combines multiple standards into one system. Chad is also the author of seven books and more than 100 papers, including several on integrated management systems. Hi, Chad. Hi, hi, Miles. Miles, thank you very much. Let me, uh, before we start the webinar, let me introduce Tom Welch. Um, Tom Welch is one of the co-writers of our lead auditor and internal auditor courses in ISO 27001. He has extensive background working in IT security. And um, since he's based out of Washington, you know, you can just imagine he's had lots of experience with the uh, NIST standards. And so we'll ask him about that, you know, uh, time to time as, as we have him present. Uh, you know, he has worked in different, very, you know, a number of different aspects, uh, functional experience supporting federal programs, life cycle support, business development and capture support, solutions positioning, and so on and so on. So with that, let us start the uh, webinar here. Folks, I'm joining you here from uh, actually China, as if you've been seeing, you know, different webinars of mine, I spent a few weeks here, and I'm happy to say uh, today's my last day. I come back home. <laughs> so here it is, ISO IEC 27001, Information Security Management Systems. And um, this webinar today, though we're doing it live and for our US audience, we're going to be doing this again for our um, China audience and India audience. We have a uh, we have five different offices here in China, and uh, we have several different offices also in India. All right, let's get started here. So one of the things I'd like to mention always is how global we are, and how we support all the different industries we do in a global basis. All right, so here is the agenda. We'll start with the overview of 27001, and then we'll explain a little bit about, you know, the, some of you might know Annex A, the high-level structure and integrated management systems. We'll allude to that, talk about that, then we'll talk about the importance of context, interested parties, scope, and the process approach before we do anything else. And then Tom will talk to you about risk treatment and controls. And then we'll finish up with an implementation overview. Folks, um, I sort of interrupted uh, Miles there when he was telling you that if you look at your you know, GoToMeeting interface, you'll see a section called questions. 
time to time, I'll try to make time available for you to enter your questions in and uh, feel free to do that as we go along. All right, then let's start with this, the definition of information security. So what is information security? Really three legs. It's confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So confidentiality maybe is what we think of the most when we think about information security, but you know, uh, really, it's not just it's made available. It's, I mean, it's, it's not made available or disclosed to unauthorized individuals, entities, or processes. Well, that's just one of the requirements of information security. Also important is integrity of the data that somebody doesn't come in and corrupt the data we have or that the, somebody doesn't come in and block the data when it needs to be there, the idea of availability. So confidentiality, availability, and integrity. Of course, very popular today, and, and especially if you are in a um, company that's supplying the government that you apply NIST standards. And let me ask Tom, to talk, uh, talk about these next couple of slides. Tom? Yeah, so good uh, morning or afternoon, everybody, wherever you are. Um, so as Chad was saying, the NIST uh, standards here, SP 800 standards, are guidelines uh, that uh, anybody could download from, from uh, government websites at nist.gov. And those documents provide essentially guidelines for the implementation of security practice procedures and configurations. Um, so while 27001 in Annex A uh, does offer a, a fairly robust uh, framework for security controls, uh, in fact, there are other uh, NIST guidelines out there that, that provide um, much more uh, of a robust framework, if you will, and that would be 853. But that, uh, most of the time that pertains to um, entities or organizations that, that, that need uh, higher levels of uh, security. So uh, the important thing is that 800-171 is, is in this standard that uh, now all all uh, entities, organizations that do business with the federal government must be in compliant with that. And that was uh, by executive order, presidential executive order. But the, the key takeaway, um, at least for 27001, is that uh, Annex A does uh, exceed 800 and at least uh, by a factor of, I guess, 20-some 20, 20 percent more with regards to the kind of security controls that you could implement. And uh, so not wanting to get too much into this, but it's, again, it's just uh, a framework uh, that offers deeper levels of security controls, if you will. Tom, shall I go to the next slide? Okay, so here, here in a nutshell, again, there's just some, some points about the NIST 800 series. Um, again, these documents are both non-specific, uh, non-specific and non-technology-oriented practices, as well, as well as recommendations for specific technologies. Um, and so, again, uh, just Anybody that's uh, in the government uh, doing business with the government will understand uh, that 800-171 was a pretty big deal this year, and you know that is mostly for the organizations that deal with the defense, but soon uh, that might carry over to other uh, civilian agencies as well. And and some of the most comprehensive set of guidelines 
in terms of risk management. Later on, Tom, we'll have you talk about the, the risk controls in 27,000 as it compares to NIST 800. So let me continue and we'll come back to that in a few minutes. Thank you, Tom. So folks, <clears throat> let's continue here it, which uh, with our main topic. And, and we highly recommend, many of you out there are supplying the government and have to follow NIST and you need a good management system. And we're gonna try and tie all this together for you as we go along. So here is ISO 27000 series and 27001 in it, which is a management system. So how do we define a management system? We have that in the document, you know, the, the ISO 27000 that has vocabulary and documentation. And of course, it follows ISO 9000 when you look at it. And here's how they define a management system. A set of interrelated or interacting elements of an organization to establish policies, objectives, and processes to achieve these objectives. So the idea would be that we establish policies and objectives on information security management, and then ISMS processes to achieve these objectives. And just keep in mind that the overall idea of the ISMS is to preserve confidentiality, integr integrity, and availability of information by applying risk management processes. All right, let's go on. So when you look at this, here you have the ISO 27000 family of documents. So a couple of comments that we have here that the ISO 27001 and 27006 are requirement standards. You could also say ISO 27000 contains, you know, what we call um, normative requirements, which I'll explain to you later. Everything else is guidance. All right. So just a couple of points here. And uh, I'll also have Tom chime in as, as he would like on this. Tom, uh, go ahead and mute yourself when you're not speaking and unmute um, when you do. So we have the, so when we, when we uh, put together the 27,000 lead auditor training, of course, the training is about 27,001. The, the definitions and vocabulary come from ISO 27,000. And um, later on, a little bit later, I'll ask Tom to comment, comment on 2702, which is a code of practice for controls, a guidance, and then implementation guidance, guidelines from 2703. So all those are helpful when we try to learn the standard. And of course, when we do auditing, we have blended in requirements from 27006, requirements of third-party audits and certification. Always good to know that, even for, from an internal auditor perspective. So here then is, for our, for folks, the 27,000 family of documents, and um, all of which we talk about when we do a lead auditor course or internal auditor course. So here's ISO 27,000. Fundamentals and vocabulary, and um, there are also principles here. The principles are not requirements. They form the foundation of requirements specified by ISO 27000. And then the definitions and terms are what we call normative re references, meaning when you see the word in 27001, it's it's the way it's defined in 27,000. So it's auditable or normative, okay? Or mandatory references, as they are said. <coughs> Excuse me. Then we have 27,001, 
which is the management system requirements itself. We're going to be spending a lot of time talking about this in this webinar. And then we have 27002, which is a code of practice and IS controls. Tom, do you want to comment about how you use this in terms of implementation guidance? Yeah, sure. Um, so 27,002 uh, is, is merely um, just a code of practice and guideline rather than a certification standard. So you're getting certified to 27001. Uh, organizations, you, you're free to select and implement other controls, um, such as deferring to, uh, for example, NIST. Um, 800 171 or 853 um, that's the that's the uh, the flexibility still in the standard um, and of course there's other uh, other suites of information security co controls as 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 you can see in uh, later on in annex a which we'll get down to that further in the slides so that's that's all 27002 is. It's merely a guideline. Thank you, Tom. So, folks, continuing on then, some questions I'd like to pose for ourselves. So true or false, ISO 27001 is a practice for the IT departments of our organizations. So, you know, it's a specialty practice. And the processes are all information systems, management systems related. So things like antivirus, you know, firewalls, and so on and so, so on. And if the IT security is practiced, um, you know, by the ISMS processes, then the organization can be successful. And really, you know, kudos to the IT department. And of course, the answer is false, folks. If you look at the, you know, pitfalls in IT security, you know, it comes in some of the biggest flaws are just in people not changing their um, uh, passwords. So it is, it's really about, you know, how we access our, you know, the our IT systems and, and the way we work and the practices we keep. So most importantly, ISO 27001 is a company-wide practice. So with that thought in mind, Tom, did you want to add anything on, on, on that part before we move on? I saw some of the nice things you had written in the very end of how this needs to be a cross-functional effort inside the organization. So Yeah, that's, that's, that's a little bit deeper and outside the scope of our discussion, but what you're referring to is sometimes often called as uh, insider threat, uh, insider threats. So, oh, you know, are, it's also could be insider ignorance, <laughs> you know, it, it, <laughs> the, the kind of innocent bad practices being carried out by people who, are, who don't even know the mistakes that they're making, you know. And, and then just bad yeah. practices being carried out by the organization. So I, I think you would agree with me when we say these that the risk controls will be throughout the organization and really to have a tight ship, it's just got to be you know practiced company wide. That's so, correct. Thank you, Tom. So let's move on as we are uh, understanding gains on 27,001. Let's look at how 27,001 and 9,001, well, what do we know? By the way, if I didn't say it, it's a 27,001 is a process focused risk based standard. You know, I didn't put the word process based there. And ISO 9001 is a process based risk standard. And, and let me just say this which I haven't yet, so I'll just say this, both have what is called a high-level structure, which I'll mention a little bit later. So definitely, both of these standards are synergistic. And along with it, a very popular idea 
that is, you know, uh, is cybersecurity. I was telling Tom how important cybersecurity has come, become in many of the industries we work in, from automotive to aerospace to healthcare. And the cybersecurity, cyberspace security, is defined as a preservation of confidentiality, integrity, and availability of information in the cyberspace. So really, let me just summarize this by saying, ISO 27001 is process-based and is integrated into the organization's business processes. Of course, there are going to be a few processes which are just ISMS alone. Other than that, the ISMS controls integrate into the company's business processes. In everything from actually audits to management reviews to uh, management reviews, we are going to integrate in the ISMS processes and the controls will be there from purchasing to you know, uh, accounting to you, you name the processes, it'll be there. But really, what I wanted to say is that the ISMS processes integrate into the business process and include cybersecurity. Folks, ISO 27032 cannot be implemented. It's a guidance standard we can look at when we implement cybersecurity under 27001. So here's the idea of integration, the idea of the process map of the, of the business processes of the organization that ISM, ISMS integrates into. And what are then the benefits of ISMS? Why do we do ISMS? Number one, reduction in security incidents. Gets, gives confidence to interested parties like our top management our, our, um, our stockholders, the government, right? Number three, protection of our brand and reputation. Folks, it is becoming commonplace today that people are getting hacked into all the time. You know, I um, <clears throat> a year ago was in a, a conference on cybersecurity and IT security and, and an organization that's typically hired in to break into companies to find vulnerabilities mentioned that, you know, in all the work that they have done so far, they have never failed to break in. How scary is that? Next, our competitive advantage. Is ISMS a competitive advantage? Reduction in financial not loss a devastating financial loss if your IP is lost. And then, of course, why do we have an ISMS? For consistency of applying information security across your organization. And many of the smaller benefits here that you can look at down below. All right, so we have different terminology. You know, much of the terminology, because of the high-level structure and Annex A, is very much common between 27001 and ISO 9001. All right. So I've been alluding to this high-level structure and integrated management systems. Let me continue just a little bit longer, and then we'll get right into the risk controls, which are part of this. But this gets right to the nitty gritty of ISO 27001. How is it structured? So you can see here, you know, it follows four being context, leadership, planning, support, operation, performance evaluation, improvement. The structure of ISO 27001 follows the dictates of ISO for all management system standards that have to be common. So, folks, you know, oh, what are we trying to say? That ISO 9001 or its derivatives like IATF 16949 or AS 9100 and 27001 are common. Not only that, 14001, 45001 really helping us. And so here's the structure of ISO 27001. 
you know, so we do see some unique parts to this, like, you know, 4.4, information security management system, you know, um, and you'll see things like 8.2 and 8.3 there under operation. I'll have Tom talk a little bit more about that a little bit later. So pretty much when you look at ISO 27001, folks, you can tell it is nothing but the high-level structure of ISO 9001, 14001, and 45001. All right. So let's take it to the next step. And you know, when you think about IT security, I know often all of us are immediately going into the controls. All right. But remember, 27001 is a management system, right? And moreover, the 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 thinking that's needed before we apply the controls is as important as the controls so so tom and i then we'll take a good look at what is the idea of the context folks the context of the organization you know what's relevant to its purpose and strategic direction what affects its ability to achieve its intended results or the objectives of an information systems management system, right? What are the issues? So there are external issues and internal issues. And um, <clears throat> so to understand this a little better, let's take a look here. And um, Tom and I were discussing company A and company B. Here's company A, headquartered in Atlanta, company B in, in California, all right? You know, relatively we can say, you know, I don't know which is which a higher risk there because of that. But look at design. Design is done right inside headquarters where design for company B is in a multiple different countries, right? And the exchange of information and as tom mentioned to me he said the the amount of risk goes up by a magnitude soon as we say company b practices of design if you look at the plants one is in usa and mexico usa china india southeast asia customers us based global suppliers company a is focused in china company b is global employee travel USA, Mexico, China, global. You can say about the same there for employee travel. But look at the employee work habits. So working at home, we're working in office. Tom, is that about the same or is there a higher risk with employees working from home? How would you quantify that risk? Well, <clears throat> there are risks with both, um, but again, it, it, it you is still very much a management function to design in the security controls that uh, you have for a remote workforce. Um, those procedures can be quite extensive. For example, if you're in the government, uh, doing business with the government, or they could be. Um, you know, not quite as not quite as extensive. So it's it depends, but there, there's there's certainly um, more risk. I mean, it's becoming uh, more and more prevalent. So, so it needs at to be company taken into consideration. Company B, definitely, Company B profile of risk is much higher than company A. So company A has its share of risks. So, so the idea of the context that we have to think about when we get into the ISS, ISMS, right? So the, the, the second topic we can talk about is understanding the needs and expectations of interested parties. So, you know, I imagine many of you, and I don't know this, already have sort of been exposed to, um, you know, uh, ISO 9000 or ISO-based standards. So I'm not trying to spend so much time 
explaining the, the common requirements. But the important idea, the thought here is the needs and expectations of interested parties are, are different when we think about, so let's see here. You know, here's an interested party. Company B uses contractors in design. So they have outsourced design, right? So customers, both have customers, of course. Both have suppliers. Employees, all of them are interested parties. Look at regulatory and government. And soon as we say in company B, uh, uh, so the company A supplies the government, company B doesn't. Company A, of course, suddenly has all these other additional regulatory requirements they have to put in place. So the idea of who the interested parties are and the interested party expectations pays a big part and covers comes into the scope of the ISMS. So top management really needs to make a decision. What is the scope of the ISMS? Does it cover the travel? So I was uh, I was mentioning one of my, one of my customers will not let their employees take their laptops from the USA into certain countries overseas, and and the idea that IP is so sensitive and so important that they're afraid they will you know they will get um, what is the right word to use here. Uh, you know, uh, hacked into, and then their their fi the firewall protection. So you know they could they could be under threat when they come back home. So in you know they're given um, certain loaner uh, computers when they travel overseas. So do we cover travel? Do we cover working from home? What is the supplier access to portals? How do they get into the company's information? What is the customer access? These are all the things that we have to think about before we enter into the ISMS. And then comes the process approach, the designing of the processes, and I showed you the process map, and the idea of the processes. So as Omnix always thinks about these, I mean, this is of course coming from ISO 9001, the idea of the process approach and the processes, a process being activities, linked activities with inputs and outputs. So we like to draw these you know, process flows describing our processes. And um, we do the same for ISO 27001. Better yet, what we'd like to do as Omnex, and some of you maybe listen to my track and the exemplar Auditor Symposium, I had the, um, I was a chair of the Integrated Management Systems track, and I mentioned today in what I say world class, a couple of years ago, I used to say QMS, EMS, and OSHAs. Today, I say QMS, EMS, ISO 45001, which is the OSHAs, plus ISO 27001, and social responsibility. This is what I see as the new world class in terms of integrated management systems. So what do we recommend? Omnex recommends integrating ISMS into the process map of the organization. The process map, which illustrates a sequence and interaction of the processes. Of course, the processes are owned by process owners, and the process owners uh, are the business owners of a transaction. So this is the purchasing process owner. This is the you know, manufacturing process owners. It is the you know, you know, HR process owner. It's not the IT process owners, right? So IT requirements are integrated in the common business processes from planning to new product development to supplier selection to change management, right? Are you getting a good picture of what we're talking about? So let me finish this discussion by asking the question, is integration mandatory or optional? Now, if you've been listening to some of the other webinars that we give on different subjects, 5.1b 
is a high level structure requirement. So you see this commonly in QMS, EMS, OSHAs, and also in ISMS. What does it say? What does it tell top management they have to do? Ensure the integration of the information security management system requirements into the organization's processes. So as I, I've said before, let me just say this. Integrated management systems is a de facto requirement of the high level structure. It's a leadership requirement. It's a shall. All right, let's go on. So the next important discussion we have is on the risk treatment and controls. And I'm going to have Tom, our expert, continue talking about risk treatment and controls. And we'll try to have a dialogue and give you an understanding of the ISO 27001 risk treatment. Go ahead, Tom. Okay. So in this diagram, we have the requirements. Uh, they're a little bit hard to make out, but you can see. Uh, the different colors illustrate and track back to um, PDA, Plan Do Check Act cycle, with the, the important ones to highlight here and for this webinar are the ones in blue. And the ones in blue, which can blow it up a little bit, but those, those clauses specifically address um, risk treatment. And for 27001, the, the primary um, thing to understand is the importance of um, a statement of applicable, excuse me, SOA, which is statement of applicability, uh, which is usually underrated. So just like in the quality manual for ISO 9001, this is the central document that defines how you implement a large portion of the information security. So the statement of ap applicability, which I don't think it's on the slide or mentioned in the bullets, is actually clause 613B. And that's the main link between the risk assessment and treatment and the implementation of your security, information security. And the SLA, his purpose is to define which of the suggested 114 controls, which we'll get to that slide in a minute, from ISO 27001 and Annex A that you're going to apply or an organization will apply that are applicable. And the way, uh, excuse me, uh, Annex A um, is uh, considered to be very comprehensive, but it's not exhaustive for all situations. So nothing prevents an organization from also considering other sources of the controls, and that gets back to our conversation with NIST. Um, so why is SOA needed? Um, first of all, uh, during any risk treatment, you need to identify the controls that are necessary because you identified risks at least from an organizational-wide uh, process that need to be decreased. So in SOA, you identify the controls that are required because of other reasons, you know, for example, because of, the, as Chad mentioned, because of le the law, contractual requirements, regulatory, and so on. Second, the SOA justifies the inclusion and exclusion of controls from Annex A and the inclusion of controls from other sources, as we mentioned. NIST, for example. So this is, again, uh, it, it's a framework. Uh, let's see. So, so what the slide now, is, again, it's, it's a little bit different, difficult to make out, but those are the security categories. There's 14 of them in the requirement. And these controls are selected from Annex A. Let's see what the next slide is, Chat. Sorry about that, Tom. Tom, uh, this might be, uh, I was muted there while I was speaking. Um, when you look at these controls, maybe one of the things you can tell them a little bit about is how many uh, controls uh, there are. We can do it right here before we go into more of the detail. 
the the number of controls that are in Annex A, the number of controls that are in NIST, and some of the discussions we're having earlier might be kind of cool to talk about. Yeah, so there's um, there's essentially, well, when you get down to Annex A and the security controls, there's 114 controls. They, they break it up by security categories. So here there's uh, 14, actually 35, I believe, security categories. Uh, with 14 um, primary risk risk control areas. Um, so that that these are these are requirements. They're they're in Annex A. Um, and again, getting back to the statement of applicability, it depends on which controls that you're implementing uh, that you know is relevant to your organization. Let's give us some examples, Tom. Okay. Well, so. Um, for example, okay, so let's say if you have uh, different different um, security uh, categories within an organization, um, the difference as it impacts IT could, for example, uh, be human resources security. It could be a company that has uh, a complete, you know, let's say 80% remote workforce. So in that case, um, you're probably going to pay attention to risk controls that impact human resources training, properly employee on, onboarding, training, asset management, access control, and so forth. That's just one example of a, an, an area within uh, within that might need to be addressed or looked at. So it, it, it depends on the organization and how they do business and how they're set up. Great. So here's another oh, we lost slide. You for a second, yeah. By the way, we lost you there for a second. You may want to repeat yourself. Okay. So, what I was saying, it depends on the organization, depending on which controls that you want to implement or not. This slide here is another example of, um, for example, an IT asset, uh, and it's uh, it's almost uh, like a process map. If you look at the IT asset and uh, the ex external and internal uh, factors that go into designing a security system around a particular um, security category. And this one here is for, you know, for example, a laptop IT asset. The security Great. controls are in green. Yeah. Excellent. So this this graphic right here, this is just a very high level overview of um, risk assessment treatment methodology. Um, it just provides general guidance on the, uh, the process steps that you might do to identify risks, internal and external issues. Um, let's see. This is okay. a continuation and, of that slide. Yep. So this is just, again, this is a high level overview of, of information security risk assessment. And uh, walking this down, you, you have the treatment of risk to use of the results of the assessment. You know, you determine the controls necessary to treat the risk from any source. Compare controls with Annex A, verify controls that have not been omitted. And the statement of applicability. So the justifications for inclusions and exclusions. So that you could formulate a risk treatment plan. Great. And you know, most importantly, a lot of people always get confused. How do I apply Annex A? You know, Annex A, is it a requirement? Is it a guidance? If it's a guidance, how do I use it? And so I thought this is very useful for our audience today on how to apply Annex A and it's, you know, many different risk controls. Lost you there just a little bit, Tom. 
Yeah, I was just saying that's correct, Chad. Um, Annex A is um, the primary um, requirements and clauses, as you mentioned before, Chad, track with, with other ISA standards, but the clauses that address specifically risk, 613B, 613C, 613D, those are the uh, requirements that you need to look at your organization and, and go through Annex A and design a risk, risk management, risk treatment uh, around the organization. Excellent, excellent, Tom. Folks, um, let me do this. Let me pause here for a minute or two while you, you know, um, write down any questions you have. And we'll, we'll do our best to answer these questions. Um, we are known time to time to stay for a few minutes after the webinar to answer it if need be. So let me just pause here to give you a chance to write questions. All right, folks, with that, let me continue here. So how do we get started? Before that, let me just sort of summarize what we talked to you about. That ISO 27001, you know, is a informa information security management system standard. And as all management system standards, it adopts the high-level structure, Annex A, and it, it follows the overall um, structure of ISO 9001, 14001, and 45001. And we also said, of course, what makes ISMS, you know, unique is the understanding, of course, your context, your interested party expectations, identifying your scope, and then integrating your processes into your o process approach, right? And then using the statement of applicability and, and your risk plan, identifying the risk controls in Annex A. So the idea is, there's got to be some justification if you're indeed not going to follow a certain risk control or risk practice. And so Annex A and the idea of risk management and risk controls then becomes a very key method in terms of how ISO 27001 is implemented. So ISO 27001, most importantly, integrates very nicely with your QMS, EMS, and OSHAs, and also with your ISO 27032 or your cybersecurity practices. In fact, we highly recommend you just not implement a bunch of software and methods without a whole you know, uh, management system to really guide your thoughts. So. So what are the implementation steps for 27001? So very importantly, it is a creating an implementation leader. The implementation leader does not need to be from IT security, but somebody top management holds responsible for implementing IT security in the organization. And then of course, a cross-functional steering committee. So, one of the first things we say is that a strategy must be, be, must be determined before what we call the discovery analysis slash gap analysis is conducted. Identify your unique context, your interested party expectations and scope. Discuss with the top management the unique aspects of your organization and the, the, what you're going to try and include as part of your scope. So, so we said discuss and plan the approach to information security management system. The strategy must be determined before the discovery or gap analysis. Then conduct the discovery analysis or gap analysis. We don't like to call it a gap because a gap just looks at the gap. Discovery is about identifying what's right for your organization, for your overall plan and strategy. Create a cross-functional implementation team with the committee and process owners. Implement your key strategies and initiatives. Document your processes and procedures. Roll out the new system. 
conduct internal audits, conduct a management review, and then third party audits. Those are the steps to transition. So some of the strategies we talk about, implementing integrated management systems. And, and just remember, when Omnix says integrated management systems, we not only mean integrated processes, integrated risk, and integrated audits. When we mean integrated risk, I didn't spend a lot of time discussing risk today, but risk is always severity or impact times occurrence or likelihood. That definition, folks, does not change. That's risk. Now, anytime you think about controls, comes in detection and the idea of you know, residual risk. So Omnix always likes to use what, what we say in integrated risk is use a common methodology, a common team for, uh, uh, you know, when you're working on a department, a process a area, use the same team for Q risk, that's quality risk, E risk, environmental risk, HS risk, that's health and safety risk, and IT security risk. They can be the same team with a different expert guiding them. All right. Second, implement what Omnix is boss implementation process or a common planning process that includes context, interested party expectations, planning, goals and objectives, and risk. Conduct process-based risk assessment. That's that integrated risk. Incorporate your controls into your business processes, right? Create a code of conduct for the organization for information security. Implement enterprise integrated management system software. Those are the you know, six different opportunities and strategies we recommend with 27001. Form an implementation plan, and then of course, implement. So with that folks, let me pause here for another couple of a minute or so for you to write down any additional questions you have and I'll summarize the presentation. So we all hate when there's just, just no noise. Let me give you some quiet so you can write down questions here. And we have a couple of dozen questions and we'll do our best here. To, to at least answer uh, a handful of them as time allows. Folks, let me go to the summary slide here. So what are the summary and takeaways we'd like you to take away with you? Number one, get senior management involved. Find out the primary concerns of senior management. What are they concerned about? What are they, why have they asked you to do IT security in terms of long-term success of the organization? Conduct this gap or discovery analysis after you have done your initial strategy work, your context work, and your scope work. Third, gain this cross-functional support you need to put this governance framework in place to support the organization's security practice. So it should this IT security practice be you know, a silo or should it be company-wide? What we recommend is a feedback loop that takes results and observations from employees across the organization and sets up corrective action to ensure processes are improved. You know, uh, effective information security management system depends on awareness and acceptance. Fourth, make sure you have a project plan with key project milestones and get process owners involved in documenting all their own processes and their own controls and their own risk. Lastly, focus on continuous improvement. 
27,001 encompasses people, processes, and technology. Just keep in mind, information security is not about technology. It's not just about the software or the firewall or locking down your laptops and web servers. It is about people, processes, and technology all working together. That, we think, might be the most important takeaway we have for you as we look at 27001. Let me do a couple of more, you know, tell you a little bit more about books here. Here's an integrated management systems book that I published with ASQ, ISO 9001 2015 in 2016. This is the training that Tom and I will be doing for 27001. We also do this training on site, folks. And then our QMS courses, our risk courses, and our EMS courses, and our health and safety courses. Folks, with that, Tom, would you like to unmute yourself? Let's, let's take on some questions here. Let me read them out. If companies can select their own controls without not really needing to implement any best practices, then what stops a company from implementing extremely weak controls and getting certified? So what they're saying is, you know, what if the company is dishonest and, and just does a sham of their controls, gets certified, but really don't have any security? You want to take a shot at it first, and then I'll take a shot at it for uh, also, um, Tom. Yeah. So. Me, um, yeah. If you want, I'm the auditor and the and the guy who ran a registrar. So I'll just add mine, and you can add yours on top. All right, folks. This is the this is the way it is in all ISO systems, and your auditor. So. Tom can add to the, the controls in there and the lack of alignment that will there be there from the risk plan to the actual controls. A good auditor will challenge you and task you. And then if, you're, if your IT security system is completely failing repeatedly, it's, it's good evidence that your controls aren't working. Tom, do you want to add to that? Uh no, that's correct, Chad. I mean, it's very likely that a, a good auditor will find uh, uh, issue and make recommendations, make recommendations for, for improvement, particularly if a security risk treatment risk security plan is, is failing. Um, you know, it, it defeats the the purpose of ISA twenty seven zero zero one. In particular, when the organization has to meet regulatory requirements and security requirements, especially, uh, for example, in my industry, the organizations that do work with the government. So, um, uh, security breaches are happening more and more. And again, I guess uh, to uh, not uh, take into consideration that you know the organization, the types of controls, just just to uh, just to get certified, if you will, is sort of defeats the purpose. Uh, Tom, let me just add to that. You know, I was talking to Tom about you know your firewall getting breached, and you 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 know you're a supplier, and you take that into the government. <laughs> uh, what was your answer, Tom, if if that something like that happened? As a supplier to the government, that your system gets breached and you you breach the government system. How long will you well, say you'll be a supplier? The supply risk chain management plans are actually becoming more and more uh, scrutinized uh, uh, as as time moves on, and the you know, third party uh, the third party suppliers that that do business with the primary. Uh, organization or entity that does work with the government, but um, that uh, when you have security breaches that affect the uh, supply chains, um, then uh, it's it's 
not looked at too kindly by the government currently. <laughs> so. Well, so Tom, I put this slide up here for the for the gentleman who asked that question. This traceability of your controls. So compare the controls with Annex A. Verify controls have not been omitted. So there is a very clear plan. Yes, you do have options, but you need to have enough justification. Right? With Correct. that, shall we go on? Correct. Great. Let's go to question number two. Okay. Aha. Uh, so right now, um, question from one of our very own, Rod Gray. Uh, let me just say, Rod, we are in the process of implementing an integrated management system at Omnex. We are following and we always try to practice what we preach when the process of doing a global integrated management system in our you know, locations worldwide with the QMS, EMS, OSHAs, uh, social responsibility and IT security, okay? So that's, that's what we're in the process of doing. Will ISO 27001 become required? What's required right now with IATF 16949 is cybersecurity audits and cybersecurity in the contingency plan. I don't know if people knew that. If you, okay. all right. So in terms of auditor qualification for, you know, the auditor qualification is very similar to other auditor qualifications. You know, you need to be an internal auditor for doing internal audits. We always, as Omnex, recommend a couple of lead auditors so uh, they become more knowledgeable as they, uh, those are for the leaders who lead the implementation. So a follow-up question, would an auditor stress the adoption of best practices of Annex A if it is found the current controls are weak? Um, in fact, if you're completely omitting something, you know, and it's found to be pertinent, you will get written up for a non-conformance, Chris. So we'll take one last question here. I would kindly ask if you can provide us an example in which it could be critical to follow. So what they're looking for um, in this one, uh, Tom, is a, uh, a critical uh, control that needs to be put into place that, you know, from the Annex A that you think is something that people should not ever leave out? Ooh. Anything come um, to mind? Well, just your laptop controls you can go to, you know, <coughs> if you'd like. Yeah. I think something simple as that, you know, that people yeah. leave up. Go ahead. Well, the primary would be, uh, you know, operations, OPSEC, operations security or access control. That would be your, your two risk areas that uh, you would never want to leave out, so to speak. Could you explain that a little bit more in sort of working terms, Tom? What do you mean yeah, by that? He, um, well, um, so, uh, you know, look, all the controls are, are fairly high level in, in effect, you know, that they comprise of the general functional requirements specification but um, the uh, for example access control um, obviously you, you want security processes and procedures in place that would limit access control to sensitive information um, you know there's there's functional ways to set that up uh, from an architectural point of view uh, IT architectural point of view that would limit access and, and streamline that but um, Access control, obviously, and, and you know, is certainly uh, um, something that you want to limit. You don't want the outside parties being able to access sensitive data. 
something is that, which is highly highly critical so it's a it's a little um uh, suggestion as an example which is critical that comes from iso 27001 that we would rec recommend giovanni so with that tom thank you very much uh miles thank you and folks thank you all for attending this webinar have a great week and thank you for joining on this monday morning hope to see you at other omnix webinars and you know if iso 27001 is an area of interest come and join tom and i as we do omnexus understanding internal auditor and lead auditor training for uh, information security management systems. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Bye-bye.